morning you guys this, this is we are the survivors <laughs> it's amazing that's uh we thought we were done with it but it's not gonna happen god we thank you for this morning we thank you for this opportunity for us to come together as your church and your people to glorify your name your power, your justice and mercy in our lives and over this earth and over all creation, all of your creation. You are the mover of time and space. May you rest in your provision and your vision for our lives. May we be guided in mercy and forgiveness and strength and courage to walk out the life that you have given us, to be light to this world until you have fully perfected it. In your death and in your promised resurrection, we find hope. now and forever. May, we, may your redeeming love guide all we do. You have conquered death. You reign supreme over our chaos. We come to you asking for mercy and in thanksgiving. And we glorify you now in song. In Jesus' name, amen. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon Final breath he gave. When the final breath he gave, his heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, a war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broke. And the ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now, in death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated.
the ground began to shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now in death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King Has rendered you defeat love could not be overcome. Now in death, where is your steed? Our resurrected King is rendered The life you gave, your body was broken, your love poured out. You bled and you died for me there on the cross. You breathed your last as you were crucified, and you gave it all for me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. There in the ground, sealed in darkness, lifeless lay. The frame of the Father, Son in agony. He watched his only Son be sacrificed. 
And he gave it all for me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. But on that day, which seemed as the darkest hour of island home, broke through and shook the ground. And as you rose, all the light of all the world was magnified. As you rose in victory, hallelujah, it is finished. Hallelujah, it is done. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross, hallelujah. Hallelujah is finished. Hallelujah is done. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. Hallelujah, it is finished. Hallelujah, it is done. Hallelujah, King forever. We thank you for the cross. Oh, we thank you for the cross. And though our sins are scarlet, you've made them white as snow. And though our sins are scarlet, you made him white as snow. And though our sins are scarlet, you made him white as snow. And though our sins are scarlet, you made him white as snow. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man 
Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. For it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart is one have paid my ransom. Behold the man. Behold the man upon the cross. My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking. among the scoffers, for it was my sin that held him there, until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me life, I know that it
morning, everybody. I, uh, what would you say, Marie? It's about 250 in here? 300, okay, yeah, wow. Through the snow, ah, it's, it's bad, you know, when you're up here lying on Easter. I mean, that's, that's bad, Doug. That's really bad. <laughs> oh, I see all these fingers pointed at me right now. Okay, I'll behave. Um, before I forget, I wanted to uh, remind everyone, and uh, well, first of all, welcome everyone online today, quite a few out there, um, but uh, I wanted to remind you that evangelist Peter Rami is coming, and he will be here next Sunday um, night at 5 p.m., so April the 11th, 5 o'clock p.m., and listen to this uh, flyer. It says, Alaska ablaze with the spirit of glory, the second wave, April fire, with evangelist Peter Rami. Come expecting the spirit of the living God to meet your every need. Okay, well, that should do it right there. You know, this part covers everything. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I'm excited about that. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've been praying for almost two years now, and not that uh, not that God is uh, slow to answer or anything like that. He's just been preparing us for what He's about to do, which is bring a massive awakening to Friends Church and Fairbanks, Alaska, and the state of Alaska. And we're going to take this glory with us uh, as we flow on down through Canada and fill the United States with the glory of God, okay? And that's, that's just the beginning. So um, anyway, this morning, I want to talk to you about uh, I want to talk to you about being really qualified for the awakening, for the Spirit of God to move in your life. And uh, I want to uh, start by just saying that the Bible, this book, is like a GPS or a, it's like a treasure map, okay? And so we look in here and the Holy Spirit um, opens the book to our understanding and we are, we come into the blessing and the triumph and the favor of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that applies to every area of our lives. Our families, our husbands, our wives, our finances, everything. And in particular, and especially, I would say, what happens on the inside, because God wants to fill you with himself. And so we want to look at this morning, um, I want to start with um, Romans 1, 16 and 17, which is a, uh, the gospel in a nutshell. It's the, the primary ingredients that uh, Jesus Christ's message to us in his uh, cross, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seating at the right hand have uh, procured for us, okay, they, that he accomplished some things there, and one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is self-righteousness, which is based on self-sufficiency, and, and, you know, I really have a concern um, for our nation, for the United States of America, because there is a, there's an epidemic not so much of COVID, but of self-righteousness, okay? And so we, we, if we are self-righteous in, uh, in our own minds and in before God, we are basically disqualifying ourselves from uh, this passage here in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Um, it says, this is Paul speaking, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. And there's five really critical and important words that are in this passage. First of all, power. 
power. The power of the resurrection is in the gospel. And it's power, it's the power of God for salvation. And that word salvation applies to us in every respect. Spirit, soul, body, finances, relationships, all of it, okay? So it's the power of God for salvation. We can't leave out the power, okay? It's really an important ingredient here. Because it's possible to have a gospel in word only. And for the most part, that's what we have in the United States. We have a lot of word only gospel. But Paul said, our gospel did not come to you in word only. In other words, it's not simply a verbal message. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so he said, our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit with much conviction. Okay? And so then he says, this salvation, this power of God unto salvation is for everyone who believes. So therefore, if you don't believe, you don't get plugged into this power of God for salvation. And underneath that is, it says, it is the righteousness of God. And, and so we have this contradistinction between the righteousness of God and our own righteousness. Okay? This is a core element of the gospel. And then it says, this righteousness of God is revealed. And, and that's an important element because it's not a matter of what I say to you today. It's a matter of what the Holy Spirit reveals to each one of you, okay? And, and I want to say, too, that this message is not for the really the sold-out Christians that, you know, so many. I'm looking at sold-out Christians right here. I'm not talking about people that are on fire for Jesus, full of zeal, full of passion for him. I'm not talking about lions in the spirit. I'm, talking, I'm primarily aiming this message at people who really maybe haven't made up their mind about Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you, the Bible is the, uh, the, the biggest selling book of all time, and Jesus Christ has, the, has impacted the world more than any other human being. So I think it pays... It, it, it pays to uh, give our attention to what he had to say. And, and really, the, you know, when the church has only a word-only gospel, it is misrepresenting the message and Jesus Christ because it's about the power of God, okay? So in Luke, and, and this is in regard to um, this revealing of the message, okay, in Luke 18, it says, Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of God will be accomplished. So this is right before the cross. This is on the way to Jerusalem. He says this. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon and after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now listen to this. It says, But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things which were said. I mean, it, it says it three times in different ways that they did not have a clue about what he was saying. And in fact, what they were really anticipating, and I believe this is the reason why the statement was hidden from them, is because they had it in their minds that he was going to be like David, set up the throne, take out the Romans, establish the kingdom in Israel, and, and go into the time of Solomon all over again. Okay? But... But that's not, you know, it didn't fit with their paradigm. So therefore, it was in a way, willful blindness. And you can see this a lot in the scriptures. There's willful blindness. And then I want to bring up the second kind of blindness, which is in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, where it says, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case... The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, 
who is the image of God. And I want to say to you, if you have not seen the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, then you are in some measure blind. And therefore, it is not that big a deal to you. And so, you know, you might hear something about the cross or, you know, the blood of Jesus or these types of things. Maybe the fact is that, you know, most people in America might have the thought that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on this day, but it really doesn't mean that much because there's a blindness, and it is a satanic blindness. And I want to point out to you, it says, the God of this world, okay, the God of this world, it's an important phrase because <clears throat> the world in itself is a vehicle, let's say, of the blindness that is being referred to here. The world blinds us from the glory of God in the gospel of Christ. And so 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, now I was talking about the body. There's things that we get caught up with in the body that have to do with the body, namely and primarily that would, that would include things like drugs, alcohol, uh, food, which would be gluttony, and sex. And I have to throw in there pornography because um, that in itself is a very serious bondage um, to people. And, but, and yet it's a, it's a, it's a thing that uh, many men especially lust for and can't get under control. So anyway, it says the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, that would be uh, money and material things, cars, houses, clothes. You know, Doug, look at him. He's dressed to the nines here up front. Very carefully selected his wardrobe for today. <laughs> he said his shirt is 10 years old. Okay, all right, fine. You're so humble. Uh, let's see, where were we? Okay, and the boastful pride of life. All of these things are not from the Father, but from the world. The boastful pride of life is just, you know, it's just uh, the, the education that you have, the position at work that you have, the influence you have, the, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's all about pride and self-exaltation. And so I like using... And we've been, we've been talking a lot about the matrix in the last few weeks because the fact is we're living in a matrix, in a world system. And, and our eyes really have to be open to the world system as well as the kingdom realm of God. Those two are uh, the antithesis of the other. It says, a, it, or I wrote down, a world system designed, constructed, and managed currently managed by the kingdom of darkness, okay? It's a system that encompasses the entire planet and has exerted its influence on every generation, race, culture, society, and ethnic group from the beginning of civilization, a system into which you were born and have lived your entire life. The matrix, this world system, has had a powerful impact and effect upon your heart and life. And to a large degree, it has defined and shaped you into who you are today. I like what uh, Morpheus, who is a, a type of prophet, I believe, in the movie The Matrix, he says... The, this will translate it, the, the world system is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window, when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. And Neo asks him, what truth? that you are a slave, Neo, like everyone else. You were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, 
a prison for your mind. And I, and I think of um, Luke 4.18 is a, is a word about the ministry of Jesus. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim um, release to the captives, recovery of sight to, to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That is a summation of the reason that God anointed Jesus. It says in Acts 10.38 that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and fire, or with the Holy Ghost and power, excuse me, and who went about doing good, healing, and delivering all who were oppressed by the devil. And that is also the mission of each one of us sitting here today and those online listening to me who, who truly believe in the power of God unto salvation, okay? That is, our, that is a part of our mission here. It's a reason why we uh, come to church, to be built up in the spirit, to be encouraged, to be uh, uh, strengthened in our knowledge of the word and in our relationship with God. And so Jesus came, and in a way, he was offering us the blue pill, and the red pill was right in front, and it's something that we all make up our mind about, okay? There's an offering to know the truth. Morpheus says, remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. So Jesus came to offer us this red pill of revelation and understanding about what the heck is going on in this planet. You know, it's not, not everything is the way it should be, right? You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. We're, we're very familiar with that, but I'm not, like I said, I'm not really talking to you guys. I'm talking to these people who, you know, come to church once or twice a year and haven't really made up their minds yet. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few that find it. That's a heavy section of scripture there. That's a heavy word from the Lord. And, and really what we need to do, even no matter where you are in God, we need, to be, uh, we need to be serious about what we do and what we think and how we uh, relate to, the, to God because we are in an, 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 a battle on this planet. There is a, there is a, uh, a transference. There's a verse in Colossians that talks about we have been transferred out of the kingdom, out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And that's what this is all about. The primary element is that we would be saved, that we would come into eternal life, that we would be transferred out of this uh, domain of darkness, out of this world system, out of our own deception and our lack of revelation of what this is all about. And so Jesus came with that red pill. And, and Morpheus says, no one can be told what this system is you know, all about. You have to see it for yourself. And in the same way, not only do you need to see the, the world system for what it really is and its influence upon you, but you also need to be able to see the kingdom of God, which is the alternative to this system. And so I want to look at the system for a little bit here. Um, the best summary of it is in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sin. This is before a person comes to the Lord and is born from above, born of his spirit. There is this deadness. There is a spiritual death that exists in everyone that has not received the Lord Jesus Christ as their 
Savior and Lord, okay? They are dead in trespasses and sins. And, and really, why should we expect anything other than debauchery and evil works and dead works from somebody who is dead in trespasses and sins? So, I mean, let's get over it and realize that we're in a uh, spiritual, worldwide spiritual war. Okay, so before Christ, they were... Uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. In other words, according to the plan of the devil. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Okay, so people who don't uh, who have not received Jesus Christ are under the influence of this spirit. And, and this is backed up by 1 John 5, 19, where it talks about how the whole world is under the influence of the wicked one, okay? And then it says, among them too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. So here we have this kind of repeat of the lust of the or the indulging of the desires of the flesh and mind. So we, we see that this system is currently managed by the kingdom of darkness and, and part of its, one of its primary purposes is to uh, undermine and tear down and attack um, the people, all of the people that God loves, which is everyone, in, in terms of their identity and their value, their significance, and their potential, okay? And, and, and then it puts you, like, on a treadmill, and it tells you what you need to be, how you need to look, what you need to have, and what you need to do to be significant, valued, and loved. Now, this is bondage we're talking about. We're talking about slavery, okay? A slavery to a system that, on the one hand, is tearing down and undermining your sense of value and identity and so forth. And on the other hand, it's telling you what you need to do to establish that identity and that sense of value and, and, and even receive love. And one of the words that kind of comes to me is, you know, people in this zone are, are, um, they are uh, trying to establish their, what a term is, um, persona, okay? And this is what persona is. It's the aspects of one's person that is presented and perceived by others. Oh, does this register with you guys? Okay, Marie, you're on, okay, and Lenora? Okay, we're good then. And I, and I think of, now listen, I love pictures of my grandchildren. I love a lot of things that are on Facebook, so it's not totally this way, but into a large degree for many, many people, I mean, this is what, Facebook is selling, okay? When you get on there, you're saying many, not everybody, okay? So don't take it that way, but not, not any of you, okay? Let's put it that way. But people get on there and they, and they say, I'm cool, I'm brilliant, I'm witty, I'm good looking, and here I am being great, having a great time. I'm on a great adventure being with great people, eating great food, having great thoughts that you all must be very interested in knowing about. So tell me I'm great. Tell me I'm smart. Tell me I'm beautiful. Tell me I'm a leader. Tell me I'm amazing. Recognize me. Respect me. Admire me. Praise me. Love me. Tell me I'm valuable and significant. Tell me who and what I am. And we're feeding off of that, what, all those likes and all of those comments, and they just, you know, like we get on there and we show some more photos, and all of a sudden we're on this, we're on this treadmill. We're on the treadmill because we're not getting our identity and our sense of value and, and, and significance from God. We're getting it from people. 
And so we've been talking about what I like to uh, uh, call BCM, which is Brain Chemistry Management. And what it amounts to is, at the bottom line is that God loves you. And God wants to put his love in you. And until that happens, you are in a love deficit. And so what we do is we go to these sources, these people, a lot of them we hardly know, but we, we get onto the, you know, the, the more I publicize myself, the better if I get that positive feedback. And when I get those comments, when I get those likes, when people subscribe to my YouTube channel, then I get a certain amount of, like a buzz. I get a, a certain amount of a pop in my brain, and it feels good. Now, a lot of people are just hanging on by a thread. They're not, they're not trying to be popular. They're just trying to be accepted. They're just trying to get approval. They're, they're you know, but it's the same. It's the same thing. No matter how high you are, on the pyramid, your position can be quickly lost, your popularity can quickly evaporate, and the fact is, is that you're never high enough. You're always trying to go higher because you're trying to fill that love deficit with the praise, the admiration, and recognition of man. So I read you this portion here about being dead in trespasses and sins and walking according to the course of this world. But I want to continue reading in that passage where it says, but God. And the word but is a conjunction used to introduce a clause contrasting what has, with what has already been mentioned. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, and even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And it says parenthetically, by grace you have been saved. What that means is, is that you did nothing to save yourself except to believe the gospel, okay? And, and when it says by grace you have been saved, it means that you are saved through the goodness and kindness of God in a way that is unmerited, unearned, and undeserved, okay? And that's the beauty of it. it. It applies, it is open to everyone because it doesn't require you to qualify yourself. It is God himself who qualifies you through the cross, through your belief in the cross that Jesus died for your sins, that he rose again after three days and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. And you believe this whole story about the gospel, about, the, about what the Bible says. And when you believe that, it's because God has graciously opened your eyes to these truths, to these facts, and you have decided to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's only two groups of people in the world. Basically, at the end, this is what it's going to be. There's going to be those who have rejected Jesus Christ and those who have received him, okay? So we're talking about something very fundamental, very basic to this whole story. And it says, And raised him up and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, that's, that's just totally mind-blowing how... How could we be seated with him right now in heavenly places? It's a, it's a, it's a place in the spirit, you guys. And, and God really needs to open that up to us. So it goes on. So, it, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, through believing, and that not of yourselves. That, in other words, this whole salvation is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. So if it was by our performance, then we could brag about it. We could boast that we had achieved a certain level of, you know, spirituality, and therefore we're saved. 
But that's not how it works. So that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has be prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In other words, you get saved, and then God has sovereignly prepared and before ordained certain things that you're going to do, but it's by the Holy Spirit, right, Lenora? It is not by our own energy, our own wisdom, our own uh, willpower, any such thing. It's, it's by the Spirit of God that these things would happen. Now, I, I want to remind you, um, if, if you know your Bible, that there's a story where uh, there was a time in the days of Moses when there was a, a kind of a rebellion that took place, and so then all of a sudden all these snakes started biting people, and, and uh, Moses was told to grab one of these snakes and put it on a pole and set it up, and then when everyone saw that snake on the pole, they would be saved from, from, from what was happening there. And it says, and Jesus said this, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now this eternal life, okay, this is something that is real, that affects you on the inside. It comes by the Holy Spirit into you and you live for eternity in this life of God that is within you. It's eternal life. For God did not send the Son, send the Son into the world. He sent his Son into the system. But he didn't send him into the system to condemn the world or condemn uh, the people, but that the world might be saved through him. This is our message. This is what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about, we're talking about being saved, not through our own righteousness, but through the gift of righteousness that comes with Christ. But I also mentioned I was going to talk to you about self-righteousness because Jesus talked a lot about self-righteousness. Self-righteousness comes from self-sufficiency. In other words, it's our own sufficiency creating our own righteousness, okay? And so he, he told a number of parables that, that would address this issue, and one of them is in Luke 18. And uh, it says there, he, told, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. That is self-righteousness. Now think about what is going on in our nation. I am really, actually, I got to tell you guys, I am more uh, concerned, far more really concerned with self-righteousness than I am concerned with evil. If you look at the widespread millions and millions of people who have been murdered, have been killed, it was by the self-righteous. And so really you have three, three, three kinds of righteousness. You have unrighteousness, you have self-righteousness, and then you have the gift of righteousness. And I think of it like two ditches on a side of the road. You can walk, you can go down that highway. God's provided a way. We were talking about it earlier. It's narrow, but it's the gift of righteousness. That is your ticket in. That is how you enter into the whole relationship with God, the kingdom. It's all based on the gift of righteousness. So anyway, he's talking about people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, tax collectors were really the scum of the earth in those days. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven and was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, there's a... Uh, the thing about the system is it, it basically runs on two, two wheels, and, and it has to do with this idea of the persona and performance, okay? And, and that when we are in that mindset, we are constantly ranking ourselves, being ranked, and ranking other people by some arbitrary standard of measure. And so there's just so much scripture on this because it's such a trap, you know? And I, when you look at, like if you, if you look at politics right now, you have so many self-righteous people who are mocking and disdaining and, and viewing others with huge volumes of, of contempt. And what are they doing? They're ranking themselves, they're ranking others, and, and they're, they're measuring, okay? So Jesus talked about this, and, and I want to read Matthew 7, 1 through 5. He says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And now listen to this. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Now I would take that and I would say, the speck represents, say, evil works. But the log represents self-righteousness. And it's a self-righteous, superior judgment. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite. That's a persona. You hypocrite. You are presenting yourself in such a way, and it's false. You're presenting yourself as better than you really are. Uh, does this sound like the United States of America? It does to me. I mean, it's like, wow. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's talking about humility. That's talking about being real with, you know, yourself and other people. Let's, let's not exalt ourselves. Let's not get into that self-righteous superior judgment. You know, one of the things that Jesus said about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he said, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And I want to read this. I want to read this little story to you. It's actually a, um, a vision that was given to a man. His name, his name was Ralph Knoll. And um, I want you to feel the fire of God on this. This is awesome, powerful. It says that uh, he saw a big banquet table in front of him, uh, and it, or, or he saw a big banquet table, and in front of him was this mass of people, everyone he had ever met, seen, talked to, or had taken note of, friends, people in ministry, right down to the prostitute, seen as he was driving through New, Newport, Vermont, he noticed her on the street corner and drove on. And Jesus was there, sitting at the end of the table. Jesus said, Ralph, I want you to seat the people. Suddenly, they were all sitting there, as, and as he looked, he thought, yep, this is exactly how I would have seated them. He had his friends and the spiritual people sitting next to Jesus, and at the far end, he had the prostitute. And then the Lord said to Ralph, Ralph, I want you to sit at the table. He thought, hmm, I need to be careful. He didn't want to uh, be too holy, so he sat in the middle. And then he, as he sat there, he waited for Jesus to commend him. And when Jesus responded, he said, Ralph, you're a hypocrite. 
You have judged in your heart every single person you've ever known, met, or taken notice of. You're not worthy to sit at the table. Get up. You're going to serve. You're going to serve this table. Start with a prostitute at the other end. Man, if that doesn't put the fire of God in your heart, I don't know what's going on with you. Man, it just it just burnt me to a crisp. I'm telling you, it's like, whew. But we do that when we have that measuring that's going on. We're measuring ourselves. We're measuring other people. It's a part of the system. And this is what I mean when, when, when I say we have been indoctrinated. We have been heavily influenced by the system because this is how it works. Every, every social group begins to form into a pyramid. And there's a few at the top and a whole lot of us at the bottom. And when we're near that top, that's, I mean, as we go up, if we're advancing up that ladder, up that pyramid, we get a certain measure of that euphoric pop in our brains. And so we want more of that. We want more of that euphoric bubble. And, and we, we find in the scriptures uh, many times when God is addressing this very thing. He said to, and through Jeremiah, he said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Do you understand this, what I'm saying here? Okay. Yes? Okay. Jesus stood and cried out in John 7. He said, he, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. So there is some living water springing up from this fountain of living water that God has for each one of us that will satisfy us, that will bring us into this place of total saturation and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when you have that, you don't need the world. You don't need the system. You don't need to go up the side of the pyramid. You don't need to try and climb that ladder. You don't need to run on that treadmill any longer. You are free. This was part of what I believe Jesus, when it talks about Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I think of two things. Primarily, it was the joy of the Father's face because he loved us so much, he sent his, even sent his son that we might be saved. And the other side is the joy that he had in seeing us set free and living in eternal bliss with God, which was why we were created in the first place. So Paul talked about this, and he said, whatever things were gained to me in this world system, in this pyramidal uh, 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 pattern. He said, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss. Now listen, why would he, why would he abandon this fantastic position, this, I'm sure, well-paid position that he was in, in the hierarchy of Israel? But he says, I count all things in, in to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. And that word rubbish is not really rubbish, it's actually excrement. And, and he says that I can be found in him, now listen to this, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. In other words, derived from self-sufficiency, because self-sufficiency was the, the corollary to the law. Okay, so he's saying not having a righteousness of my own derived from self-sufficiency, 
but that which is through, through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that free gift of righteousness, and why? That I might know him and the power of his resurrection. So we're, that is the ticket, people. It's not having a righteousness of our own, but the righteousness that comes from God through Christ, through the cross, through the blood of Jesus. Well, we can all enter in. It even says that in, in Hebrews, how we are to enter in through the veil. That is his torn flesh on the cross. Come into the holy place. Live filled with the Spirit. Live filled with the life, the power of God unto salvation. Not only for ourselves, but for our city. It's the transforming power of God as we're transformed and, and transferred out of the uh, domain of darkness into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Wow. And so, Jesus said, and, and um, uh, Josh, I don't even see you, but you can come up now. I just want to pray for everybody. And I want us to really humble ourselves today and I want to uh, I just wanted to refresh us in the gospel the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes for therein is revealed the righteousness of God in Christ that's, that's, that's the message today and we can rest in his righteousness we can rest in that the blood has cleansed us from all sin we can rest even in our conscience because it says in Hebrews that he has, uh, through the blood, cleansed our conscience. And so there is, a, there is this place in God where we can be utterly free in our minds and we no longer have to be in this bondage. We don't have to be on this treadmill any longer. We can be freed and we can live as free new creations in Christ, okay? Now, if you want to go get Josh, I don't know where he went. Oh, there he is, okay. So I want to pray for us today, and I want you guys to really, um, I want you to come to church next Sunday and, and those meetings that we're going to have beginning uh, next Sunday at 5, and then we're going to have some more Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Sunday again. And we're just going to push through. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to break through. Many of you are just going to break through into a wonderful place of freedom and joy you have never known in your life. And God is going to move. And we're, we're anticipating uh, God really doing some significant things in people's lives as we set apart, you know, night after night to seek the Lord and to see what he has in store for us uh, uh, this year. And, and, and I believe that um, uh, P that God is going to give Peter a special anointing and a special word for Friends Church. In fact, I'm sure of it. He said, he told me the other day on the phone that oftentimes when he walks into the building, he'll get a prophetic word for the church. And I know that you guys are, we have been through a long, dry spell, but the drier the wood, the man, the hotter the fire, right? And that's what's going to happen. There's going to be an outbreak of the fire of God and the anointing of God, and the presence of God. And so I want you to come in the righteousness of Christ next week and anticipate seeing the power of God released. And now it's not going to be just some meeting. It's going to propel us right through the summer and fall and, and into everything that God has for us, not only this year and the years to come. And I'm believing for a great awakening, okay? So I want to just close by praying for each of us and saying, God, we want to enter in to that joy unspeakable and full of glory that comes through the knowledge of Jesus Christ and all that he attained and achieved for us in his cross through the blood, through the sacrificial death, through the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the seating at the right hand of the Father, and, and, and recognizing that even we are seated there as well in full authority, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, 
and that, God, you have gifted us and you have anointed us with the Holy Spirit that we might go about doing good, healing, and delivering all that are oppressed by the devil and ripping off this world system from people's hearts and minds that the blindness be removed and that a revelation of Jesus Christ, even the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. God, that they would receive a direct encounter with the Father, and that, God, they would enter into that place of personal, intimate, and experiential relationship in the love of God. So, Lord, I, I, I just exhort and I pray and I declare that, God, we are entering into a new dimension, into a new stage, into a, a, a new time of the Spirit of God at Friends Church. And we thank you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was falling his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him One final breath and he gave his heaven looked away. The Son of God was weighed in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broke. And the ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated forever. He's glorified forever. He's lifted high forever. He's risen. He is alive. He is alive forever. For The ground began. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now, death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever he is glorified. Forever he is risen high. Forever he is risen. He is alive. He is alive forever. Ha! 
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. And we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, and we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb Amen. Happy Resurrection Day, church. Have a blessing week.